Dr. Ray. It's the top of the hour, and we have a lot of familiar faces. I'd like to welcome everyone. Greetings, everyone. This is Dr. Ray Lindley from Array Global Accreditation, and we're so pleased to present this, the third back-to-school workshop that we have done. And as we have announced to you, we have dedicated today's workshop to talking about uh, questions that you have sent to us. Uh, we are so excited that we received over 200 questions of uh, topics and issues that uh, you would like to have us discuss. And so what we've tried to do is to put some of the, we can't possibly answer 200 questions in this one, uh, one hour. However, what we're what we're doing is we've tried to put some together and to uh, put uh, answers to some of the questions thinking that it'll also touch on another one. But we do ask you if we have, if we do not answer your specific question uh, by, the, by the end of the one hour, uh, please uh, either write to us on uh, Facebook Messenger or on our email and we'll do our best to give you an individualized answer to your question. So with me today, we have uh, Dr. Jake Frankham and Dr. Salam Noor. We are the three founding members of Array Global Accreditation. And it's through the hard work of the three of us that uh, we are able to present the programs that we do offer. And uh, I'll be introducing them in just a moment. However, I wanna make a special welcome to two groups of people today. First of all, I wanna uh, welcome a group of about 70 educators from East Africa. Mr. Kalangi is the leader of this group. And these uh, educators are very anxious to be working with Array Global in the countries of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan. And so we're excited to begin working with these countries. The initial uh, work that we've done with these people has been very positive. One thing that I, I knew this was a good group of people, when one of them put on their, uh, on their message of uh, this statement, I became a teacher because your life is worth my time. That was directly from one of these educators in East Africa. And so I thank you all for your professional uh, stance and we will be anxious to work with you. The other group that we're pleased to welcome today is a group of uh, educators from 15 schools in Lebanon that are joining us. And uh, we will be working with them to uh, standardize and work with them and the ministry in Lebanon. And uh, uh, under the uh, direction of uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Nawal Shafi, and, uh, and uh, she's working with them and we are working together. But we want to, uh, we want to welcome you all. We'll do our best uh, among the three of us to answer your questions. And if we have time, if you put your question in chat box, we will try to answer those if we have time at the end. If not, I encourage you again to uh, uh, send them to us either by Facebook Messenger or by email and we'll do our best. So I first want to introduce Dr. Jacob Frankham. You all know him. And uh, he's been largely working with this group in East Africa and has been in great contact with them. So Dr. Jake, welcome and uh, give us uh, your wisdom for the day. Oh, my wisdom for the day, I don't know. Uh, hopefully we'll have a lot more wisdom coming from our other two great leaders that are here with us. But yes, a special welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ray. It's a pleasure to be with you um, this evening uh, where we're at, where I'm at, it's the morning time, um, but we're just so happy to be here with you. And, and hopefully a lot of this will be a support and. Uh, help you out as you transition back to a new school year. A few different things that we wanted to make sure that you're aware of. Um, a lot of you, as you're starting the school year out, are looking for ways for school improvement. We'd encourage you to look at Array Global Accreditation. It's easy to apply. It's right online on our website. Uh, you, you fill out a short application and we recognize the accreditation if you, if you are already accredited and you have three or four more years left. We recognize that. Um, we are providing a golden year discount this year, uh, so the annual fees are much cheaper and much um, uh, understandable because of the, the COVID situation that many of you are dealing with. And it's a great process to help you improve and to grow and to develop as an institution. So we encourage you to get onto our website, look at the accreditation process and any other services that we do provide. 
also like to announce um, our next academic contest, the 2021 Writing Contest. It's the Write Around the World Contest. We have two different categories, the essay, which is a 500 word essay, how to make my world a better place. I mean, that's so uh, a great topic for all of your students to be able to address and talk about. And then poetry, you can submit uh, a poem um, on a topic of your choice. So we're really excited to be able to offer that academic contest. The, the past academic contest we did in the spring uh, was very well, well received. We had many, many contestant uh, people who were involved in it, and we're just excited to be able to be part of this and involve your students um, and get them in, in, excited about learning and growing. Our next workshop um, uh, is going to be on the third Saturday. We now move them to the third Saturday of every month after this, uh, our, our back to school series is over. Um, and our own Danny Eichelberger will be presenting. He's our, show, our associate director, and he's gonna be talking about writing, writing with a purpose, moving students from good to great because writing has shown to provide so much growth in, in learning and growing um, academically that uh, it's something that we should all be focusing on regardless of the topic. So that'll be Saturday, April 18th at 9 p.m. Saudi Arabia time. And so I would encourage you to make sure that you sign up for that, put that on your calendar and invite those colleagues that, uh, you, that work with you. And then last week we were excited to announce that Dr. Ray Lindley will be in Saudi Arabia in September 17th through the 23rd. And many of you have already signed up, filled out the, the survey to have him visit, have him come and visit your school or for you to visit with them, um, maybe at the hotel or at a restaurant. Please fill out the survey if you haven't done so already. He is there to help and support you, um, talk to you about the services that we provide and, and just overall provide support as you uh, start up your new school year. So I will put that in the chat, um, the, the link so you can sign up. If you've already signed up for have, to have him come, you don't need to fill that out again. Um, but uh, we, we're excited to have him travel to Saudi Arabia. It's been a while that we've been able to travel. So this will be an exciting time for, for him and for schools to be able to interact and get some, some wisdom as they are transitioning back to school year. Another quick announcement as we are uh, finishing up the, the workshop, at the very end of the workshop, we will uh, post a uh, survey. It's the post, the post workshop survey. Please make sure you fill that out. If you don't fill that out or if you fill that out incorrectly, you, will, you won't get a, a certificate. And we want to provide all of you a certificate. So please make sure that it's filled out, it's filled out correctly, um, and that uh, you, you get that done um, at the end of this workshop. Another thing to announce is that if you want to publicize your first day of school, your first week of school, please send us pictures of that first day or that first week of school so we can publicize it on our social media. Then you can be tagged to it also and uh, you can show your, your family and your friends everything that's going on. So a lot of great things going on, Dr. Ray. It's, it's an exciting time as we start the year and we have some great support and <coughs> services that we, that we are providing to schools. So back to you. Well, thanks. I just realized when you were putting that date for my visit to Riyadh, uh, on September 18th, I'll actually be in Saudi Arabia. So you'll see me uh, at Saudi Arabia time uh, on yep. the 18th. So yep. that'll be interesting. I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Salam Noor. Uh, I think if you really want to know more about him, read our website and his, uh, his experience. This man is known nationally for his educational expertise. We were so honored when he wanted to join with us to be the founding board of uh, Array Global. And uh, he is uh, just full of all kinds of information that I think will be beneficial to you. So Dr. Salam, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? And I think we'll start on the questions. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ray, Dr. Jake. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's really great to see so many faces from around the world joining us this morning, and I'm really honored to be uh, with you, and I'm honored to be joined by, by my two colleagues, um, Dr. Ray and Dr. Jake. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I, I've been in education for nearly 30 years in the United States, working in multiple states and multiple levels, K-12 and higher education, working locally and at the state level. 
And currently I work in a, um, in a variety of capacities, but I spend a great deal of time working with high schools in particular relevant, relative to improving outcomes, uh, graduation outcomes specifically, but making sure our students are well prepared to transition to college and the workforce. And a, and a significant part of that is really focusing on 21st century skills. And speaking of 21st century skills, many of you sent us questions. We've received hundreds of questions. And a large number of those questions asked about 21st, 21st century skills and how they fit into our teaching and learning or our educational environment in the midst of a pandemic. So uh, I'm going to touch a little bit about 21st century skills, but we will continue to talk about those throughout the webinar because many of the other questions nicely flow into those and, and connect with them. But uh, 21st century skills is something we've been talking about for a long, long time, quite frankly. It's not something new to us. And I would even argue that it doesn't matter whether we are in a pandemic or not. 21st century skills are really integral to teaching and learning and what happens in school in order to prepare students for the world that they're going to go out into. So they've become a very common topic of conversation in schools and districts in the United States, and I'm sure in your schools and, and uh, countries as well. I've worked with schools to develop what's called a portrait of a graduate, and a portrait of a graduate essentially identifies those skills that every student must have as they exit our system. We typically develop those at the secondary level, and I'll talk about, I'll give you an example of what those are, but we typically develop them at the high school level, and we use them to inform the learning and the experiences that students need to go through at previous, previous levels, like in, in middle school or elementary school. So when we think about students that have been, have been placed in our care, if you will, have been trusted to us as educators to make sure they are prepared, whether they're going from elementary to middle or middle to high, we often think a lot about co college readiness, college preparation and college readiness. Um, I think it's important that we, we think about career readiness at the same time, because some students, and especially in the United States, don't go to college directly. They actually enter the workforce as they exit high school. But what we often not pay enough attention to is life readiness. So 21st century skills essentially require that we prepare students for college, for career, work, and for life. Many of you may be familiar with this book. It's called The Global Achievement Gap by Tony Wagner. Tony refers to those skills as survival skills, and he has seven of them. And they range from seven to 20, quite frankly. But basically, the underlying premise is that in order for our students to be prepared to meet the demands of the world that, we, that they live in, the world that they're going to live in, because you have to keep in mind that we're not just preparing them for today, we're preparing them for the future. And in order for them to be prepared to meet the demands of the economy that they're gonna step into, we have to exp expand the skills that students learn. So we often focus on knowledge like math, social science, science, etc. 21st century skills really start to focus us on skills not just what students are learning, but how are they learning? Have they learned how to learn? Will they navigate complex uh, situations, whether in the classroom, in the playground, or in life using those skills? And those skills are really, really important and they need to be incorporated into our curriculum instruction and assessment. I focus on, um, I, I tend to actually categorize these skills into three buckets, so to speak, or three categories, learning skills, life skills, and literacy skills. So when we talk about learning skills, they're often referred to as the four C's. And the four C's are critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. In the United States, 
today, we, we complain a lot about the lack of creativity in our students and even individuals entering the workforce. So we are emphasizing the need to teach students to be creative, innovative, inquisitive, curious, etc. The life skills involve flexibility, initiative, social skills, productivity, and leadership. And when we think about the context that we're operating in today during the pandemic, I think we have to demonstrate those life skills both as adults and our students have, have done the same too. Now, literacy skills uh, go beyond just reading and writing. Literacy skills involve information literacy, how to actually navigate information, how to judge the sources of this information, how to determine what's, what's factual and what's not. They also involve media literacy and technology literacy. So students that are operating in a 21st century setting, whether it's the economy or any other context, they need to have proficiencies in media and technology. And that has been proven during the pandemic because many of our students had to rely on technology to access instruction. And our teachers actually have to rely on technology to provide instruction. So those 21st century skills, and we'll talk more about them later perhaps, are really essential for education in general, but I believe they've become even more pertinent and more essential during the pandemic. I'm gonna move on to the next question, uh, next set of questions that we receive, and many of them revolve around um, teaching at the elementary level and teaching math specifically at the elementary level. And I would say we have to think about that beyond the social emotional learning component. A lot of the questions asked about how do you teach math, social emotional learning at the primary grades level. And I just read an article where parents are actually uh, supportive and favorable to us teaching social emotional learning, but they really don't like the word they don't like us calling them social emotional because when I think about it, those are really 21st century skills. They're not just social emotional skills. They're 21st, 21st century skills. But the question uh, really focuses on primary grades and how do you teach math at the primary grade? So I'm gonna touch on that briefly and then we'll move on to the next set of questions. So for those of you that are um, uh, primary grade teachers, I think you would agree with me that students come to us with this tremendous sense of curiosity, this inquisitiveness. They are hungry to build relationships. They are hungry to learn from us and learn from other students. They're eager to learn. They're social creatures, so to speak. And they're sponges. We say sponges in the United States because they just absorb every, everything that you give them. And uh, they're quick learners. So when we think about instruction at the elementary level or at the, at the primary grade level and math specifically, that's what I'm gonna to speak to. I would say the first thing is to make it hands-on. Students, especially younger students, they like to touch things, they like to feel things. They like to not just conceptualize. Conceptualizing may be really difficult for them. So make it hands-on, make it application-based. Use visuals and images and use visuals and images that the students are actually familiar with. So those may be from their home. Many students in the United States have Legos and I'm sure the same abroad. They have toys and things that you can use to incorporate into your lessons to make that component relevant to them. What's important for us is to, to find opportunities to differentiate instruction at the primary grade level, because just like any other level, students learn at their pace some learn at a much accelerated pace, some learn at a slower pace. So you have to really develop the skills to differentiate instruction and meet the needs of the individual student. I think what's important for elementary grade kids, just like any other kid, quite frankly, is to give them the opportunity to ex explain their ideas. So engage the students in conversations about what they're learning, how they're learning, what does it mean to them? How do they feel about it? And I understand there may be five, six, and seven-year-olds, but it's really critical to get them to explain their ideas, to verbalize, and to engage in the learning process. 
One thing that I think is really important, especially when we think about the richness of different cultures around the world, is this idea of storytelling. Can we make connections of stories that are specific to countries and cultures to what's actually happening in the classroom? Can we have the students tell stories about things that they really like about? For example, a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old probably loves football. I'm gonna call it football. I'm not gonna call it soccer like we do here in the United States. Can you get that student to talk about a football game and talk about how many passes led to a goal? How many players are on the field? How many substitutes does a team actually get? Get them to talk about their experience about something they love, something they care about. So when we talk about storytelling, it doesn't have to be this big elaborate story. And remember, you're telling a story, but the students are telling their story. They may take, talk about something that they baked at home with their parents. They may take, talk about something that's happening in their neighborhood. Can you incorporate that into a mathematical application in the, in the classroom? Um, use show and tell concepts. Again, that's part of the storytelling. Have the students talk about something that happened at home that involves counting, visuals, representation, explaining ideas, and so forth. The last thing I would say, and this is something that we learned during the pandemic, we underscored the importance of feedback. Give students meaningful feedback. And don't just give it to the entire class. Remember, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, we all want to feel special, but it's even more important at that age. So as you differentiate your learning and you differentiate your instruction, differentiate your feedback. Give specific feedback tailored specifically to the individual, as well as the general feedback to say to the classroom, they're all great, they all deserve a, a blue star or a gold star, if you will, and, and that they're doing well. So differentiation in terms of instruction, but also feedback. Feedback is really, really important for any student at, at any stage. With that, I'm going to stop here and turn it over to you, Dr. Jake, for the next set of questions. Yeah, there's a good question, Dr. Salam, about um, life skills. You talked a little bit about life skills, and Roxana asked a good question. Um, talk a little bit more about what life skills are, or maybe Dr. Raykan, I'm not sure, and how we can incorporate that a little bit more into this content area. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. I think life skills can very easily be incorporated into every lesson and every classroom and every subject area. Students um, need to learn to be flexible. That is one thing that we actually learned during this pandemic. We had to be flexible as educators in terms of how we manage the technology and how we delivered instruction. We had to be flexible in terms of the scope of instruction because we couldn't deliver everything online. So we had to kind of truncate it and sometimes cut the instruction and, and the content short. So flexibility is a wonderful trait that allows students to navigate complex situations and challenges at a personal level, but also in school and ultimately professionally. Initiative, many students, um, and, and this is something that I've experienced actually, not just with younger students, but even with my college students, when I teach courses at the university level, they're waiting for someone to provide instruction. They're waiting for someone to provide direction. They're waiting for someone to suggest what they should do, how they should do it, when they should do it. What if we taught students initiative to identify where the problem is, identify where the opportunity lies? So it's not, an, it's not enough to just identify the problem. We want them to identify solutions to the problem. And that requires the learning skills, the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, but this is really all about leadership. When I think about life skills, I think about leadership, teaching students to lead, teaching them when to engage with other leaders and to recognize that somebody else is leading, but they can be contributing. And that's part of the social skills. When we talk about social emotional skills is being able to gauge, when do I engage? What's appropriate for me to say and do? When do I rely on somebody else to lead? When do I need to step up and lead myself? So you can actually take the instruction that you're doing in the classroom, organize it based on project-based learning, thematic learning, involve the students actually in determining the learning that should occur in the classroom. And believe me, they will tell you, I am always impressed 
with, by how insightful students are. I just finished working with a high school here relative to their vision, mission, and their strategic plan in general. And we convened a small group of students and we talked to them about what the adults did. The students were so mature, so insightful. It actually, val they actually validated everything that the adults did. And now the adults feel secure in what they did and they're gonna move forward with it. So I just think when we talk about life skills, um, as a parent, I always tell educators, what do you want for your own child? How do you want your own child to develop and grow and prosper? And make sure you want that for everybody else. I think that's really what makes us successful educators is when we want for everyone what we want for our own child. Dr. Jake, we can spend a lot of time talking about this. As yeah. you can see, I love this topic. Yeah. But we I, 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 I saw I saw a great example of what you just said, Dr. Salam. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I was in a school. Uh, uh, they were uh, fourth grade students were in the STEM program and uh, they had put, uh, well, I call it contraption together. And the whole idea was they were to hit uh, an object and it was supposed to send a ball down to the edge of the table and knock some styrofoam cups down. Well, the students, they kept doing it and it wouldn't work. So they went to the teacher, 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 what are we doing wrong? And the teacher did not answer their question. He said, go back, look at the instructions and go through step by step again. An hour later, I was in another classroom and the students came running to get me to say, hey, guess what? We figured it out. You know, that is real skill because yeah. they figured it out themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, and, and one thing that Dr. Ray talked about, um, I think last week was uh, a great program, um, and we hope to have a presentation soon about it, about the leader in me. Um, and that's what you were talking about, Dr. Salam, about um, making these students be leaders and be able to work through these processes like Dr. Ray was talking about. Um, and and uh, there's some questions in the chat right now that talk about um, leaders and motivation. And that's the next topic I wanted to talk about. Uh, Karwan uh, writes in the, in the chat, nowadays learners don't like to study because of the pandemic. So how can we deal with this in this pandemic? And that was exactly the topic I wanted to talk about today is motivation. How do we get um, our students motivated and our staff motivated? And I wanted to turn that back to everyone who's here. We have a couple hundred people here. I wanted everyone to take about 20 seconds in the chat and write one or two words of how you motivate um, your students. So take just a few seconds and, and uh, write something in the chat that you use, because many of you have, have already been teaching online. Um, some of you are transitioning back to face-to-face, -to -face, but what do you do? Let's see what uh, people are doing. We got bonus grades, merit chart. Oh, a great way to track how students are doing. Rewards, positive words. Ruba, I really like positive words. We're getting into um, uh, relationship building, commendations, behavior management platforms. These are all great incentives. You know, when I hear about incentives, I don't just think, you know, monetary or points or anything else like that. But sometimes incentives might be that you get to spend a few minutes on Zoom with your teacher alone. Um, getting them involved with things that they love. Bara, that's a great, great process. Positive feedback. Uh, Yasmin, you know, no homework. That might be something that could work too. Yeah, that's a great way to get them engaged. Uh, Hoda, I like that, you know, gifts, candy bar, clap your hands. They like to get that recognition with them. And the merit chart, you know, positive, Heba writes positive comments, commands, things like that. Showing support. Um, and Amber, I really like that designing of lesson plan and implementing as student centered by following their thoughts. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do to keep students engaged during this pandemic is do inciting, exciting lessons that they're going to be able to apply. And Dr. Salam talked about that a little bit already, um, making those lessons so they want to be engaged and they want to learn. Uh, Heba writes about competition. What kid doesn't like to uh, be part of a competition. It's just, uh, that that's something that we all want want to do. Um, but I think, yeah, and there's a lot of different things. Letters to parents, Tony, Mr. Tony, great. Letters of language of encouragement. 
um, going to a place that they like. You know, and as we talk about that, Ahmed uh, writes, going to a place that they like, that doesn't mean that you have to go on a field trip. Some of you are not able to travel at this point, but um, you could take them virtually on a trip somewhere and, and let them and see uh, and talk about some different places. I think those are all great, great things. On, on Facebook, um, uh, there's some comments also, gifts and showing support, Catherine Richard writes, um, just the, there's a lot of different things. Delphine writes positive words. And I think as we get to this, the, a big thing that we, we start to look at is that the relationships are so important. And we go back to a, a popular comment that we've said in many different workshops, there's no significant learning without a significant relationship. And when you hear that comment, that doesn't mean that it, it doesn't signify if you're doing online learning or face-to-face -face learning or anything like that. There has to be a significant relationship. And so you need to get to know your students online if you're still online. Some of you are, are fortunate enough to go back face-to-face -face learning, which is probably it, it is easier to build those relationships face-to-face, um, -face, I believe. Um, but do the best that you can in, in building those relationships. I think as you do it, as you teach online, you have to go out of your way to build those relationships, get to know your students, get to know what their struggles are, what their strengths are, giving them time to do some show and tell and talk about the things that they are doing. Um, but you have to find ways that can engage them um, and, and get them talking, get them involved. And that's what's going to motivate them the most. Um, and there's a lot of comments and all these comments, as you see, are uh, are ways that we, we not only motivate students, but I think a lot of these things are also ways that we motivate our staff members, our colleagues. Um, if you're an administrator, I think that's a great way to motivate um, your, your teachers is to get to know them, see what they need. Um, the common phrase from an administrator should be, let me know what you need. Let me know how I can support you. You need to be servicing them and you need to be helping them and seeing what they need. Um, because you're the tool that helps them be effective teachers. And so um, I think it's, it's so, so important to make sure that we are supporting our teachers and our students as much as we possibly can. And that starts with that relationship. Um, and Dr. Ray, I know there's a lot of other comments in there. You probably see some, um, but I could go on and on like Dr. Salam. Uh, topic of motivation is so important. Uh, and that relationship component is, is so important too. Well, the next question is really very, very close to what Dr. Jake has been talking about. And that uh, the question is, how do you get students engaged uh, during the pandemic? And really the, uh, the question is pertinent, not only during the pandemic, but in classrooms in general, if we had all of our students face-to-face uh, -face in a classroom, even uh, disregarding the fact that we've been in the pandemic, how do we get students engaged? Now, there are kind of three levels of engagement. There's what we call low student engagement. There's what we call teacher-driven engagement. And there's what we call student driven engagement. And as educators, what we need to do and want to do is to move towards that third area, student driven engagement. But we have to start with something. For instance, so many times, uh, either in low student engagement or teacher driven engagement, uh, we give worksheets and say, hey, here's the worksheet, work on this, or the teacher stands and, and talks and explains and, and everybody, uh, all the students are supposed to listen. Uh, there's very, the classroom is very quiet usually because either the student is busy doing a worksheet or working on some project on the internet or whatever, and not really engaged to the student driven engagement level. And, and I think as educators, we have such a tendency to tell all we know. Listen, if you'll just listen to me, I'm going to give you this information. Hopefully you'll get it. By the way, I'll give you a test on Friday to see if you listen to me. And so, uh, uh, so we have to uh, uh, we have to understand that we need to get to student driven engagement. Well, how do we do that? There there are a, uh, there's a term called collaborative learning, and that collaborative learning is learning how we can get to this subject together. For instance, uh, a teacher might give some basic information and then turn it over to small groups of students. And when I said that 
that uh, usually in student uh, engagement or in the teacher driven engagement, classrooms are usually, usually pretty quiet. We should aim to have our classrooms a little bit noisy and we can control the noise. But if these students are working together in small groups, that's learning to be collaborative with each other. You can give students real roles and responsibilities. For instance, you can put a group together and give an assignment to each person or give some general assignments and let the students choose who is going to do what. I think it's a temptation when you put groups together to uh, say, I would like this student to be in charge of the discussion. Well, you're choosing that student because maybe there's a feeling that this student is going to do a good job. Let the students choose their leader. Just say, or what you could do is just do a, a just do a thing. For instance, sometimes when I do workshops and I put them in small groups, I, I've done things like this. With the person whose birthday is closest to today, today is August 28th. With the person whose birthday is closest today, figure it out in a group, raise your hand. They say, you're the leader of this group. Now, would the person who, uh, who uh, had oatmeal for breakfast, raise your hand. You're the recorder. For, see, it, that, that's not the teacher. So if we're going to get students engaged, let's give them roles and responsibilities. And you will be surprised at the outcome these students will develop because uh, they will develop what we call student ownership. If I'm involved in it and I have some say as to what it is, we want to get students engaged let's give them some responsibility. Now we as educators, we as educators can monitor that, walk around to the tables, listening to them, letting them talk, letting them present their ideas, but we can monitor that. And so we then can let them self-assess. And for instance, you might ask questions like this that you can monitor. Please answer the following questions on your paper. And then I understand the concept we've been talking about. That's a good question. Monitor that. I, uh, I can demonstrate this concept to other people. It's of a math concept that's easy, easier to explain. Uh, I can explain this concept. I could lead a group to, and let the students answer those questions themselves. Or I could uh, have a discussion about this. And even though I don't know it all, I could lead a discussion. And so these are kinds of engagement strategies. And then as we do this, we can increase the difficulty of the tasks. That's great student engagement, seeing where they are, seeing how they work together and say, wonderful job. As many of you have said back here, uh, that we encourage students, we, we give them uh, rewards, we say great things to them. But we then can say, you have done such a great job. Let's go to the next level. So those are all kind of my thoughts on, uh, on uh, the questions that involved with the encouragement. And, and, how, and Dr. Ray, excuse me. Yes. Dr. Ray, there's a few different questions coming in about differentiation. I think Primrose has a great question, a great a topic about how do we create differentiated classroom environment that caters to individual differences. And I think there's also some questions about scaffolding. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about differentiation and scaffolding? Sure. Well, first of all, we're going to be talking about, we can jump ahead to the scaffolding question, which is coming up here in a few questions. We can do that now, or we can do it later with uh, Dr. Jake, when you and I will be talking about that one. And then when we're talking about uh, the very last question that hopefully we'll get to today, but as usual, the time is running really fast. The very last questions on how to deal with different levels of students. So we can do that now, or we can wait until we get to the question. I'll go for this. Might be, this might be a good time to, to have us jump in and talk about those things. Okay, so let, let's talk about scaffolding first. Uh, first of all, uh, scaffolding is a, uh, is a term which a lot, of, a lot of people understand the concept, but they haven't used the word. And scaffolding is really the ability to differentiate, if you will, differentiate the uh, lesson uh, or the assignments or the work to the level of the students with the understanding that, that uh, the uh, level of students will be different in each classroom. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's really what scaffolding is. Dr. Jake, you've got more on that, I believe. Yeah, a little bit on scaffolding. Um, 
and, and uh, as we talk about that and we talk about differentiation, I think making sure that we are catering to individual differences, uh, and that's specifically what Primrose actually wrote about, because I think we do need to help and focus on uh, the students' strengths and their weaknesses and be aware of where those weaknesses are at and be able to um, best support them. Um, and, and I think Dr. Salam mentioned this a few days ago when we were chatting. That's one of the biggest things we are going to see from uh, this pandemic is being able to really individualize education uh, for, for our students because we've had to do that so much during this uh, during this pandemic as we've been teaching online, we've had to focus and target on specific areas. And so as, as you get into um, teaching and you get into teaching again this year, we encourage you to really focus on the individual, um, focus on what, what specifically skills they need, um, assess them, figure out where their gaps are at, and hone in and target those specific gaps. And then those students that excel in certain areas, help them because that's all part of differentiation. Help those upper level students be able to um, keep growing and developing in those areas and encouraging them to strengthen um, those specific areas. I think that's all part of the differentiated process. And so I think, Dr. Salam, I think you're up next with uh, uh, supporting staff during the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Jake. And, and the, the one thing that I would add, if I may, before I jump into the next set of questions uh, relative to differentiation is relationships, relationships, relationships. You cannot differentiate if you don't know who your students are. So get to know your students, understand their styles, their learning level, their capacity, their social emotional needs, if you will, we touched on previously on that previously. But I think what's key for us as educators is developing and cultivating positive relationships with our students, that give us a better sense of where they are relative to what we expect them to do and, and to know. Now, the, the next set of questions really focused on staff and uh, essentially how can we best support our staff during and after this pandemic? And the best way to answer this question is for me to underscore that our humanity, if you will. So when Dr. Um, Ray and Dr. Jake were talking about engagement and motivation, I would say the same is true for us adults in the system. We are human beings and we are feeling and experiencing similar things to what our students and our families are experiencing. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that and recognize that we're all going to be affected by this situation differently. So I think it's really important for all of us, whether you're an administrator in a school or a staff member, a teacher, et cetera, to be mindful of the stress and emotional needs of yourself and others around you. I think it's really critical that we acknowledge the challenging we are facing. And we did something in our state, in Oregon in particular, that we call Care and Connect. Care and Connect is something that we implemented relative to students and their families. We basically encouraged educators to care and connect first and then teach second. So again, going back to the relationship and attending to the needs of the students that we have. So I would encourage you to apply the same principle to each other, care and connect. Um, the schools that I currently work with when, when teachers come back to school next week and we start to engage in all staff activities, that is the first thing we're going to do is care and connect. Connect with your colleagues that you haven't seen for almost a year. Find ways to connect with students that you haven't been with for over a year. So I think it's really critical that we attend to the emotional needs of ourselves of, that we have as individuals. Now, I think there is a practical component too, because we are operating in, a, in an environment that is crisis based right now. So I think we should uh, create the appropriate space for people to ask questions, for people to get involved in the decision making process. I think communication becomes absolutely essential during a crisis. So I always tell administrators to communicate and communicate often. And it's okay if you're saying the same thing because things change fairly frequently. That's what we experienced here. Things right now in our state are literally changing from week to week in terms of 
mask mandates, um, see, uh, health mandates, all kinds of things are changing rapidly. So I think being flexible, I would say the 21st century skills that we talked about for students become really applicable here. We need to be flexible. We need to be adaptable. We need to be resilient, if you will. But the other structural piece to this is normalcy. I always advise administrators to maintain normal structures as much as possible and normal routine interactions as much as possible. And what I mean by that is staff meetings. Even if we have to shift to online learning, still have staff meetings on Zoom. Give people the opportunity to connect. Give people the opportunity to ask questions. Involve them in key decisions and key communication. The other thing is the educational structure that we have. For example, um, professional learning communities. Maintain professional learning communities because that's where people come together and they can talk about what they're experiencing, but most importantly, maintain the educational and instructional frameworks that we have for learning. Um, curriculum committees, et cetera. So flexibility is really important. Being mindful of the needs of the individuals around you, recognize that everybody is experiencing the same thing. Give teachers the authority to determine how much to teach. So we recognize, you know, we talk about engagement, we talk about motivation, we talk about understanding and differentiation. That means teachers need flexibility to determine how much to teach, to what set of standards, et cetera. So I know that's a lot of information, but basically attend to the human needs uh, of the environment that we're operating in. And Dr. Jake, you're a superintendent, you're attending to that every day, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so I will stop here and we'll continue, we'll continue to talk about that. And one of the things that I will transition to you with Dr. Jake is, the flexibility, as I mentioned, relative to what gets taught, flexibility to assignments and homework, and I would say flexibility to assessments, because we are required to administer certain assessments, and we've had to be flexible in our state, and I'm sure in your schools too, as to how that happens. Okay. Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Jake. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I really liked what you said. It really resounded uh, for me as an administrator. And Dr. Mohammed Nassani, he wrote something very, uh, I think, pretty neat in summarizing what you were talking about. Um, it's creating a community and it's creating a community of learning. And that's that's so important. And and, and that's what we've recognized over this pandemic. Um, and, and the question that I wanted to talk about, it's a pretty, uh, pretty all encompassing question. What were some of the most important things that we learned um, as far as 21st century skills because of this pandemic? And I wanna make sure that I give everyone opportunity to write some of the things down in the chat that they learned from this pandemic. So if everyone could take about 20 seconds, write one or two words about what you have learned uh, through this pandemic that you're gonna be able to take on for previous years. Love to hear what you guys are thinking um, because we have a lot of different things um, that, that we have learned um, as, as administrators in, in different parts of the world. And I've talked to many people, but write a few different words about what you have learned. Because I liked what uh, you said, Dr. Salam, about being flexible. If there's one thing that we've learned the most on, it's, it's flexibility. Um, and that's coming in the chat too. We see that flexibility. Uh, being up to date with modern technology, so important uh, that we do that. And, uh, and how important the internet is. I mean, when I was, you know, 20 years ago when I started teaching, internet, you know, it was out, but it wasn't so um, necessary. You could still do it. Patience, Idris it, uh, writes patience, so important that we have patience and that we show understanding. Uh, Ermina writes, rise up to the challenge. This has been an amazing challenge that educators have been able to show what they're really made of uh, and be able to prove to their communities how important education is. It's been, it's been great to see. There's, there's a lot of positives that come out of this struggle that we've been having to deal with. Uh, using different types of online activities, Swala, Swalha. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, allow risk-taking uh, 
sense of humor. That's so important, Hoda. Glad you mentioned that. Uh, so some things that we that we need to talk about too is um, as far as as what we learned through COVID is uh, focusing on specific standards. As as we look at external assessments and things that we've learned, uh, we haven't been able to teach every single thing that we've wanted to. And I think that's, uh, it's one of the questions that came up. How do we prepare students and staff for external assessments? Uh, we have to really just focus on the jackpot standards. We did a wonderful workshop a couple months ago. Uh, Miss Jessica and Miss Gemma did a presentation on jackpot standards. They're from Las Vegas. That's really popular, well known for, for gambling. Um, and jackpot was one of the words that they wanted to focus on. So focusing on in your education, in your classes, on those standards that are most important. Um, and, and not to say that there are standards that are not important, but there is a, a, a level of importance for some of these standards to help students, all of them, be successful. And so that's one thing that we did learn. Uh, also, um, accessing knowledge. Uh, many of you wrote about technology, how easy it is to access information on the internet uh, but we need to make sure that we're providing a good way of learning. Um, and then uh, we've all talked about this, uh, about uh, attending to the needs of learners and focusing on relationships. Um, that's been so, so important. And I, and I think we've hit a lot of these other things. We have a lot of comments coming on um, in the chat about how, it, how to adapt. Um, a little bit different than being flexible because you do have to adapt in a lesson. Um, online professional training has grown tremendously. Five years ago when we were visiting different countries, um, the ministries didn't even, they weren't even in favor of online learning and online schools as much. Now um, they're embracing it. There are more and more online schools, which a quick plug in for Array Global Accreditation. We accredit several online schools. We'd love to be working with any of those. So um, Dr. Ray, I think that's, is there anything else that um, any, uh, anyone else wants to comment on that as we're slowly wrapping this up no let, let's move on there are just some uh, other questions here that we want to address uh one that uh, there was a, a question uh from someone i passed up here now about last week's workshop is it available and yes it is available it's available both on our facebook page it's available on youtube and you can get that and the reason why i'm uh, repeating that is there's a question about how do we change the mindset about uh, the curriculum is not just the textbook. And if you will listen to the workshop from last uh, Saturday, last week, you will hear a very strong answer from me about that. The textbook is not the curriculum. It is a resource to help you teach the curriculum. So you have to have a very strong curriculum framework with scope and sequence based on standards that are uh, that are very much uh, based on international looking and so forth. And then you can use the textbook to help you, but you're going to have many other instructional tools. So I won't go on to that. But the next question I wanted to spend just a minute with how to start class in the morning. Uh, morning routine for depressed kids. I, I Perhaps some of you have heard me share this. But let me say, first of all, it is the teacher's responsibility to set the mood for the classroom. You don't set, you don't allow the students to set the mood. When they come in, they're going to come from all of these different places where their minds are here and there and everywhere. The teacher sets the mood. I was asked to do a workshop for a school in a country, and the type, they wanted me to talk about student management. And I told a lady uh, who had asked us a question on Facebook, I'm gonna be talking about this today. And I, I believe this, we do not have student discipline problems. We have teacher discipline problems because the teacher doesn't set the mood of the class. So we're doing this workshop and they asked to, uh, to do a workshop on uh, student management, student behavior, student discipline. And so uh, before the workshop, it was a two-day workshop, two hours after school each day. And some of you have heard me say this. So the, when the teachers came in the first day, they had all just had their full day of teaching. And I had written on the board all of the things. Here are the class rules. You know, if you want to uh, ask a question, raise one finger or whatever. We had a bunch of things like that. Over here, I put something about classroom environment, what we expect. 
in the middle, I said, before class begins today, would you please write a short paragraph on, and I gave them a topic. So, you know, they were all greeting me. Some of them had met me before. I'd met, we were, hello, how are you? Good to see you, that kind of stuff. So when class began, I said, how many of you d have done the assignment? On the board, it says, teachers, before class begins today, please, and I asked them to do something. Nobody had done it. And they, oh, that's us. I said, well, it says teachers before class begins today. The, oh, oh. So anyway, we went through that first day. The second day came and uh, I purposely was not there at the time the class was to begin, but I had written on the board before class begins today. And I asked them to do something. When I came in 10 minutes late, every teacher was doing the assignment. In one day, the teachers had learned, this is what's expected of us. And I think when we're talking about uh, getting started in the morning, we can waste a lot of time with taking role, with seeing who got their assignment done, with talking about this, but we need to have on the board in front of the students, here's what we're going to do today. Here's our goal. But before we begin, do this or do that. Uh, think about uh, the favorite food that you like to eat during uh, a feast, uh, whatever. Get them thinking about something so that they've got an activity. So let's think about this. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher a long time. I'm not I'm not criticizing teachers except to say, if we want students to be motivated, if we want students to not be depressed, let's let them know in a pattern what we want. And it's just, it's just a very, very fulfilling thing to do to see students when they come in. Yes, the teacher should greet them at the door. Every student should be greeted at the door. Hello, Dr. Jake, how are you today? Uh, I enjoyed watching your uh, soccer game. Somebody says, is it soccer or football? Dr. Salam said that. We call that soccer here in the United States. Hey, Dr. Jake, I saw the soccer team or the football team last night. You did a great job out there. Sorry for the, for the uh, loss, but it was a great job. Hey, Dr. Salam, yesterday, did you happen to see the program? Uh, I know you really like to study wild animals. Animals. Did you see that program on PBS last night about what? And every student should have some special connection with the teacher. And somebody asked a question a little bit ago, well, is there a danger uh, in this relationship with students? Of course, there's always a danger. But I think the danger is more that there is no relationship than that there is an inappropriate relationship. So I think we as, as professional educators, we have to understand what uh, uh, what that relationship is, and and we can be very uh, positive. I'll lead on to uh, connect between math and any other subject. I mentioned that last week when we were talking about coordination. We mentioned you can teach math in any subject. Mentioned the idea of uh, uh, point spread uh, in a game. How many points uh, is the average spread between the win winning team and the losing team? That's a physical education question. Or maybe in an English class, you could give something that's definitely related to literature or writing or whatever, and you can ask them and, and relate how the math thing uh, goes on between those, uh, uh, between those or among those subjects. So uh, that's, connectivity is really important. And so many of you have written wonderful comments on the chat box here about relationship with students. Let's not forget that's number one. And remember what I said at the end of the workshop last week, the most important thing kids need today might not be what's in your lesson plans. Okay, so let's not forget that. And I think we'll move on. Our time is almost over. So let's uh, move on. Um, Dr. Ray, as you were talking about um, morning time, uh, Amber talked about uh, making sure that we have enough nutrition for our students and making sure as they come in in the morning, specifically some of the younger kids, I think that's important to, to be aware of, that they need to have some of their basic needs met for them to be able to learn effectively. That's exactly true. And that's one of those things when we get to know our students, uh, we'll know uh, and we can make special uh, arrangements if we need to that are not to, to embarrass the students. But uh, 
but to help the students. So if it's a matter of nutrition, yes, I think that what we can do is, is set up something for the whole class, making sure that we know that there are some here who might not have had uh, breakfast or might not have had the nutrition they need in the morning. But that's an individualized thing. We don't want to embarrass kids in front of the other students. But I think we can find a generalized or uh, maybe uh, we could work it out with our, our cafeteria. We could tell a student, hey, if you come in 20 minutes early, I've already asked the people in the cafeteria uh, if they will help you and if, if, without embarrassing the child. So yes, there are specific things we do. And Dr. Ray, if we wanted to wrap it up now and give people time to fill out the survey, the post-workshop survey, and then we can answer some of these questions like we've done in, in weeks past. Um, we could do that as people are filling out that survey because we need to make sure that those are completed correctly and, and Yes, done and, well. and we said earlier that we were going to talk about the different levels of students and so forth. And uh, I think the specific question is, is it best to put at the level of students in one class and the advanced students here, uh, the slower students here, the average student students here? Uh, I have to tell you that I'm not a proponent of that. Uh, there are times when it's it's necessary, but I think we need to understand that if we will try to group students in their projects in such a way that they can learn from each other, sometimes that's the best way they can learn. And students can help each other. I would rather see and give give the group some prompts, some 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 very, very uh, pertinent information as to how they can help each other. Uh, I really, I have really seen wonderful, wonderful opportunities for students to learn from each other, and they'll speak in their own language. So, you know, I, I, I am not a proponent of, uh, of just separating, you know, three levels of students in three different classes because uh, we're, we don't know why the student might be uh, a little bit behind in this subject, but putting them together, it will make them feel important and like they are really part of, of the whole group. So I, I just wanted to touch on that one. Well, as we wrap up, Dr. Ray, um, I'm going to post the post-workshop survey in the chat. Make sure you fill that out. You fill it out with the correct email address and the name that you'd like to have on your certificate. Um, I think we're going to spend, uh, we're going to stay a few more minutes here on Zoom to allow you some time to fill that out um, and certificates will be sent out on Wednesday. If you do not receive it by, by Thursday, please contact us and we'll make sure that we process that. But please make sure, fill it out, um, fill it out correctly and uh, it won't delay you getting your certificate. And let me just finish, I always try to finish with something uh, somewhat inspirational, I hope it is. I ran, uh, I ran across this statement and I just challenge us all to make this part of our being. And it's this, I wasn't born just to teach. I was born to inspire others, to change people and never give up even when faced with challenges that seem impossible. I was born to inspire others, to change people and never give up. I ask us all to really make sure as educators, we understand that. Uh, Dr. Ray, I've never heard that quote before. That is, that is powerful. Um, yeah. Well, I have a few I, more I could throw at you if you want. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that, that's great. Do we want to answer some of the questions that uh, are, uh, have come up um, that we didn't get a chance to? Sure. As long as people are willing to stay, I think we are. It's the middle of yeah. the day for us. Well, it's always good to give them a few minutes to, to fill out the, the survey and making sure that it gets done um, uh, correctly and, and that we're able to process it well. So um, if we wanted to keep going down some of the questions, because I think there were a couple that we wanted to hit on that uh, we didn't get to. Um, uh, let's see. You know, I think one of the biggest struggles that the question that has come up in the chat and has come to us specifically is how to help people improve their English skills, especially during this pandemic when we're having to um, be involved uh, on this distance based learning program. What, what I've always told people is, is the biggest thing that can help you learning another language um, 
is to just practice, practice, practice. And I think Dr. Salam talked about that. Practice, get people talking, get people engaged. Let students go into breakout sessions on Zoom. Zoom has a great way to do that. Google Hangouts has an awesome way to do that too. So have them talk, engage in one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, making sure that they're talking in, in English or whatever language that they're, uh, they need to practice and have them practice, practice, practice. I know we've also talked about it, Dr. Ray's talked about it a little bit too, is having them hear it, watching movies over and over again. Um, I'm a second language learner. I like learning uh, another language and I am always listening to um, the, the second language that I'm, uh, that I'm fluent in. Um, I don't get a lot of chance to practice uh, the language, but uh, I like to hear it. I like to listen to it. I like to um, read it. Um, and when I get a chance to also speak it. So that's also one way, but doing it online, that's a great way to get people to keep learning and, and to uh, practice. And Dr. Okay. Jim, if I may uh, just add to your, um, to, to your recommendation, I was actually think, thinking the same thing, practice, yeah. practice, practice. Repetition makes perfect, quite frankly. But uh, I would suggest, especially for reading uh, purposes specifically, is to differentiate reading, is to have varied reading, read different subjects, different topics, different areas. So they're not reading the same thing over and over again, because a great deal of the English language in particular is context. So when they see the words in different contexts and different applications, it starts to take on more meaning and it becomes natural to them. And that's, you know, that builds on some of the comments that Dr. Ray said relative to our curriculum. The book is not the only curriculum that's available to you. You are a facilitator of curriculum, if you will. So use different texts, different materials, different resources to expose students to content, but throughout through that process, you develop their language and their, their language skills, if you will. So, and writing, the other thing I would suggest is writing. So reading and writing, writing what you heard, because part of, I'm a second language, my native language is Arabic, as you might have guessed, so getting your ear accustomed to what you're hearing is really important. But the writing part is what we discovered helps a lot of people learn a second language because when they write it, they internalize it. I don't have to write it. I can listen to it and I'm fine. But I know from working with students that the writing part is equally important. I, wanna, I want to address a question. I'm going to ask Dr. Salam and Dr. Jake to speak to it. I did a little bit ago. There's a question from Moaz, I believe. Define the boundaries of the relationship between the teacher and the student, especially high school students. I talked about that a little bit ago. Uh, the boundaries of a relationship with students. Uh, you're both currently working in schools. Uh, how would you answer that question? I've got my thinking, but I'd like to hear yours. Well, Dr. Ray, I mean, you talked about going to their activities, being involved and knowing what they do, uh, but there definitely has to be a boundary in place. Um, someone mentioned that it's not so much a relationship as it, a, as it is a rapport, um, and we could get into talking about what the difference is for that. But uh, I think getting to know them, knowing what they like and what they dislike, and, and just being involved and showing an interest in their life. But the boundary has to be there. We have policies in place that we do not allow teachers to interact with students on social media or texting um, outside of school hours um, at, at any time um, that, that could lead to something more inappropriate. And we have to regularly train our teachers too on that to make sure that they're, they're maintaining that boundary. I guess not training, but just reminding them because most teachers are, are well aware of that. But I think reminding them that they have to be cognizant uh, of that, that boundary, that relationship. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing that we can possibly do as, as administrators and, and working in a high school. I, I've worked in a high school for a very long time and, and I, I really like the high school students, but they can start to blur that boundary. And you always want to maintain a sense of professionalism. You always want to maintain a sense that you're the mentor and you're there to support them. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Dr. Ray, for bringing that up because um, different cultures, of course, deal with that in different ways. I would highly recommend having policies in place, as Dr. Jake mentioned, because the policies will help define the boundaries of that relationship from the beginning. And the policies actually is what the educator, what the teacher educator 
can fall back on to say, I can't engage in this relationship in this manner, although I want to because I care about that student and I want to help them. So having those policies clearly defined and in place is absolutely critical. The other piece uh, is the relationship piece. And uh, uh, someone on the chat earlier talked about the sense of community. Um, I, at a very basic level, if we treat everybody with respect, respect and dignity, I saw those comments in the chat, respect and dignity, uh, care, connect, having a relationship around the health and well being of the student, the learning capacity and potential of the student, the learning performance of the student. All of those things can happen in a classroom environment and a school environment that's open and transparent. You are going to have students that need different types of needs. And I think if you have policies in place, you can determine how to address those, whether it's something that gets reported to an administrator, something where you call the parent because you're concerned about the well being of the student. But at a very basic level, if we treat students the way we want to be treated, where people care about us, people respect us, people treat us with dignity, they honor who we are, and they show that we are individuals that deserve our empathy, our compassion, everything. Um, it's really that simple. It, it's relationships and, and getting to know who they are. And as Dr. Ray said, it's the way you greet them, the way you welcome them into your classroom, the, the way you organize your classroom to show them that they're respected and they have dignity. Yeah, I heard once, uh, your students don't need friends. They have plenty of friends their age, but they do need you to be friendly. And Dr. Salam was just talking about that, uh, uh, that very issue. Uh, we have to have that, but they don't need friends. They have plenty of friends, right, right. but they do need you to be friendly. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another question. I don't know. We, I think we have a few more minutes. We could stay on from Sumari, S Sumara. Uh, she said, what is the easiest way to make children get interested in studies? As nowadays, there's a lack of interest. Uh, and I know, I mean, there's been a lack of interest before the pandemic, but the pandemic sure uh, made it a lot more difficult. Anyone want to tackle that one? Um, I, Dr. Jake, I can simply answer that in, in one word, choice. Yeah. Give students choice. Let them decide what they're interested in. Give them the opportunity to tell you what they're interested in and give them the opportunity to pursue that. And then in a very, in, in a very subtle way, you can bring them into the standards and the skills that you want them to learn. So what that's, and by, in my view, what's lacking in our education system, and especially in the United States, is this notion of choice. Give students the opportunity to tell you what they're interested in and let them choose the subject or the topic that they want to study. Yeah, and Yasmin writes, um, some students don't know what they're interested in. And I think as a person that is working as a teacher, you have to try and feel it out and show them different things and help them figure out what they might be interested in. Um, it, it takes some time. Sometimes with some students, it could take some digging. Absolutely. Right. You know, there's one question and, and we've uh, dealt with this before. It's from Simon Appe. She, he writes, um, how, student, how, can student, how can teachers assist students who need online classes, but whose parents are not online? Um, Simon, I can answer that specifically because in my role as an administrator, I've had to deal with that because there's, I live in a rural part of the United States and there are some places that they do not have internet access um, in the places or not very good internet access. So what we, were have, what we had to do is set up a paper-based program where we were actually going and delivering the paper uh, the worksheets, the handouts that they were able to do. And then we met with the students outside a little bit. And then we met with them on the phone because most people do have a phone. And so as I think as you as you get into this, you have to be really creative uh, in, in building those relationships that we talked about, helping them get engaged and then following up with them. It, it's a tough job. I, I, I But you're not the only one. There's many other places and countries. But again, it, it's something that we've specifically had to deal with. Any, anything else to add on that? Well, I, I want to add something to what Dr. Salam said about student interest. 
I don't remember a lot about uh, my undergraduate work when I was at the university, but I remember one thing only from a class that I took on how to teach reading to students. And I'll never forget, there was an article that said, some start with comics, comic books. That's the level where they are. So if that's where they are, let's give them that. Let's get started with it. It's still reading. We might think it's useless reading and it's not necessary, but I'll never forget that one. Some start with comics. And I don't remember, as I said, much else about that class, but I do remember that. Well, I think we've gone a little bit longer. Um, is there anything else that we want to? Dr. Jake, can I respond to one comment in, sure. the, in the chat that says that subjects are obligato obligatory? Yeah. I totally understand that. I'm not suggesting that students choose whether to study math or science. They have to study all of those things. But what happens in that subject is often dictated by the teacher and the textbook. What if this become, Dr. Ray talked about collaborative learning earlier. What if the learning in every classroom and every subject uh, to a degree becomes a collaborative learning process where students and teachers are working together and the students are given a choice in, you know, what do you want to write your paper on? Um, everybody has to do the same assignment. Is there flexibility and differentiation in terms of how that actually happens? If you're utilizing project-based learning or thematic-based learning in your classroom, why not give students a choice on what project do you want to work on? And my job as a teacher to make sure that that project is connected to the learning objectives and the learning standards and the outcomes and the skills I want the students to have. So we're not suggesting that students choose what subject area they want to study. It's just in that classroom and that subject area that we give them choice to demonstrate their interest and and you know the freedom to to pursue their interest to the extent possible. I like that, Dr. Salam, because when I was teaching science, uh, when I have them do projects, I give them three different options. If we were studying Newton's laws of motion, they could make a movie, they could write something. Um, or they could demonstrate something for the class. And, and it was it, because all students have different talents. They like different things to do. And we had so much fun doing it. I even had a group that did what Dr. Ray was talking about, a Rube Goldberg machine, where the ball would have to come down the, the inclined plane and hit something and go do something else. And, and so giving them those different options, it was a great way to get them, uh, get them engaged because they, again, they have different talents, they have different interests. And, and just getting them interested um, with the way that they want is, is an, uh, as an outstanding way. You know, and sometimes it goes back to a question that Dr. Salam uh, answered about uh, staff. Sometimes let's go to our other teachers in the same school and say, hey, I have this lesson on blank. Do you have any ideas on how we can make this more interesting? What do you do in your class? And we don't have to be isolated in our classrooms. We can talk with other teachers, either in the school or somewhere else and say, do you have any ideas on how we can make this more meaningful? We can help each other. Yeah. Well, I think this workshop has been a pleasure to be in. I, I'm glad we were able to answer a lot of questions. Dr. Ray, Dr. Salam, it's been, it been great to, to be motivated and inspired. I mean, every time, even though I'm a presenter here with you, I always learn something to take back to my schools that uh, uh, I can help in, in providing a, a quality education and helping every student meet their potential. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone take care. Thank you.